I've noticed uh, quite often, especially in academia, a kind of lack of perspective with regard to uh, events in the world and especially with regard to cause and effect. People often attributing causes to things that didn't happen until after those things occurred. And let me just give you a couple of examples of what I mean. The issue of capitalism and slavery, for example. It's not unusual for people to blame the existence of slavery on capitalism, even though slavery pre-existed capitalism. In that case, it's very difficult to claim that there's a cause and effect there. Yes, capitalism did have an effect on slavery. It ended up abolishing it. But it could only do that after it existed. It did not cause slavery to come into existence. Slavery was a worldwide, a global, if you will, form of labor that pre-existed uh, the rise of industrialism and the rise of capitalism. So that's the kind of problem that I see. Let me give you a more recent example of that kind of misunderstanding of cause and effect, and that was the energy crisis in California, which was blamed on privatization. Okay. I lived in uh, Southern California for 20 years. I witnessed the creation of that energy shortage over a 20-year period. Uh, my energy company was San Diego Gas and Electric, and there are other ones throughout California. Now, in the 1970s, the San Diego, and, it, and San Diego Gas and Electric is a monopoly, a government-granted monopoly, so it's not private. Okay. Nevertheless, the people who ran that monopoly had the job of providing energy, and they were trying to do that as best they could. They owned sources of energy, but the Public Utilities Commission required that they get rid of them because that might make them into a monopoly. Right? So they were forced to sell these sources of energy. Now, if I had a private energy company, one of the things I would want to, to ensure was that I could get energy to sell to people. And one of the ways I might do that is to own energy sources. But SDG&E was required to divest itself of its energy sources. Okay, so they tried to solve the problem then by entering into long-term contracts with people who did provide energy, but they were told, nope, can't do that. Long-term contracts would have done exactly what the, that fair trade thing with coffee did for the farmers. It would have guaranteed a steady price over a long period of time, but they were not allowed to do that. So, and I remember distinctly having a conversation with one of my uncles by marriage, one of my in-law uncles, who is an electrical engineer uh, in Northern California, and we were discussing, you know, what the ramifications of this were going to be. So I moved out of California eventually and moved to Florida, and then, uh, but I would go back and visit occasionally, and I became very much aware of this problem. It was the problem that resulted in uh, Gray Davis being recalled and Schwarzenegger taking his place. Okay. Um, but what was interesting to me is that the energy problem was being blamed on privatization because what had happened is eventually, uh, after the government had wrecked the entire energy system, it privatized it. And then the consequences that were the consequences of government actions were then blamed on the, on the privatization, okay? Even though those problems had been created long before the privatization took place. So that's the kind of thing I'm hearing constantly negatives about certain processes that are, in, are happening, but cause and effect uh, have no relation to each other or they're absolutely re historically reversed. I see a similar thing happening with globalization. Now, there are lots of different definitions of globalization and I choose to look at it a little more broadly than Adam did yesterday. As movements of people, capital and resources and power around the world and the growing interdependence of people in the world, okay? This flow is differential. It does not have the same effect everywhere. It doesn't flow equally everywhere. And it affects people differentially. And that's a main thing to remember. But globalization is occurring more rapidly. Uh, these things are occurring more rapidly than they did in the past, largely due, I think, to technological innovations in communications, which make people more aware of what is available. Uh, and with the desire for people to find new markets, and people have more access than ever before to information, goods, and services, 
and the ability to travel. So people are, are finding out more about what other countries and cultures are like. To know the effects of globalization on any group of people, whether it's women or minorities or anyone else, entails a knowledge of the context in which they live and their history. And in this sense, all this kind of knowledge is local knowledge. We can't talk about the fate of women, who are 50% of the population. We can talk about, except in a very general sense, and I can tell you, uh, give you some uh, information about that, but it's not going to be meaningful to women in a specific country who may be differentially affected by globalization, either positively or negatively. Uh, so that's going to vary. So what we need is perspective. Okay, and perspective is a form of knowledge. It's the form of knowledge we get depending on where we stand in reference to a problem. If we're very close to the problem, we see it in a very particular way. We step back a little bit and we get a different take on all that knowledge. We step back even further and we get an even broader perspective. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. I'm going to work in a different time frame, um, an anthropological time frame. Now, as you know, different peoples have different senses of time. Uh, in a future-oriented society such as the United States, our time frame is extremely narrow. You're lucky if you remember what happened within the last 20 years. That's a long time for Americans. Okay? <laughs> if you live in an older society that venerates age, then you might look back 100 years or even 1,000 years, a lot of time in the Middle East. We in the West don't understand the problems people have in the Middle East because we, you know, our attitude is get over it. <laughs> you know? That happened 100 years ago. What are you still fighting about that for? But other people have longer perspectives, and, and that makes a difference. Anthropological perspective, I'm going to take it back a couple million years, okay, to the beginning of human existence. Because if you want to understand where we are now, you have to understand where we got there. If you want to understand inequality, if you want to, want to understand the role of morality, and those things have come up quite a bit, you have to understand how we came to be unequal and why moral questions are important or moral principles are important. I'll leave it to the physicists to go back the billions of years to the beginning of the universe. That's not necessary for us here. But I am going to go back a couple million years, start there, and work my way up to try and explain uh, some of the effects that we're seeing today. So hold on. It's going to be a bumpy ride. Okay. Now, uh, and ignore for the most part what's going on here up in the screen, because that's just a reference for me. It's not going to be very detailed, so I'm going to, in fact, turn on the lights. Okay, but before I did that, you might notice that the um, particular PowerPoint background I chose to use were scales. Scales can uh, be a symbol of justice. Uh, I use them because a lot of this story is about equality, which is something we haven't talked about in great uh, detail. But I think this story is, in many levels, about equality. So let's go back to the beginning. And the beginning is in Africa, okay? All human life begins in Africa. When the first uh, human-like creatures emerge, the Australopithecines, they emerge in different parts of Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa. Uh, as that uh, more sophisticated species uh, that looks more like us today evolves, the Homo genus, uh, Homo habilis, Homo erectus evolve. This is mostly in East, uh, East Africa. Uh, that's also in Africa. Homo erectus uh, is kind of peripatetic, so Homo erectus spreads out to the rest of the world. Okay? But then more humans evolve in Africa, and that leads to us, modern humans. That also happens first in Africa. Uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, that's us. Now, at different times, there was more than one human species okay, in existence at the same time. But that is not true today. There's only one human species, and that's Homo sapiens sapiens, us. And we are all related uh, to, to our ancestors in Africa, so we are all Africans. I don't care what you look like. Okay, your ancestry is African. And we can verify this now that our, our science of genetics has improved so greatly. We know that this, in fact, is the case. Okay. Uh, and I can go into that in more detail if you're interested, but I'm sure you don't want to hear about the whole process of, of analyzing mitochondrial DNA. Okay. <laughs> Anthropologists have a way of acknowledging this unity among human beings, and they call it psychic unity, the psychic unity of humankind. We are all equally human. There are no subhumans. Might have been, 
had some of those other species evolved. They might not have had the same capacity as Homo sapiens sapiens, but they didn't survive. Um, so we are all Africans. African is the mother continent. Africa is the mother continent, and you all know what that means. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Okay. <laughs> now, in fact, um, there's always been a kind of, I want to talk about human social sociality now, and this is the quality that we have, the necessity we have of relating to other humans. We're connected to one another. Our lives depend on that connection. Okay. I talked about this a little bit when I talked about individualism. Um, and one of the interesting things about that is it, it's a survival mechanism. Our association with one another is one of the reasons why we are such a successful species. Remember I said earlier, if I weren't human, I would want to be human because we're such a successful species. We inhabit all kinds of climates and environments on the earth, uh, even really hostile and, or uh, difficult environments, let me say, such as Antarctica. And that's not simply the, because we have a great deal of biological or physiological flexibility we do, um, but because culture helps us to solve problems that allow us to live in environments where we didn't originate. Okay. And, and a good example of this is there was, in fact, another human species. They had brains as big as ours. And for a long time, we didn't know uh, exactly what the relationship was between the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens sapiens. In fact, Neanderthals are Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. We are Homo sapiens sapiens. For a long time, we didn't, nobody knew what the relationship was. Uh, were they a separate species? Uh, did they intermarry with us and they're still here? Uh, did we kill them all off? Uh, what happened to Neanderthal and who was Neanderthal? Okay, because we found a lot of these um, remains uh, all over Europe. And it turns out now, again, thanks to DNA technology, we do know that, that Neanderthals were a separate species of human beings. They did have the same brain capacity that we did. They separated from us somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 years ago and went to Europe. Now, Europe was still cold. The Ice Age had not receded yet. And so all of the adaptations, the physical characteristics of Neanderthals are adaptations to cold. That's why they're bigger. They have bigger bones. Uh, their skulls are a little bit thicker. Um, this is an adaptation to the cold. Uh, presumably, they survived by hunting mostly, the megafauna, the gigantic animals. Uh, and that was their way of survival. Now, Chris Stringer, who's a paleoanthropologist from England, believes that there's a lesson in all of this, that in fact the Neanderthals did not possess as a group the same kind of human sociality that Homo sapiens sapiens possessed. And there's increasing evidence about this. For example, they would often lived on, on the uh, shores of lakes, but they never exploited, they never fished, they never ate clams or anything like that. There's no evidence that they learned uh, some new subsistence. And so one possibility for their demise might be that once the huge megafauna had been hunted out, they sort of didn't have an alternative. Something that I've just recently uh, been told by a physical anthropologist who has the office next to mine, which is fascinating to me, it's not quite yet substantiated, but it, it sounds pretty good, is that Neanderthals also did not have a sexual division of labor. And the reason uh, paleoanthropologists think this is because when they look at the skeletons of males and females, they all have the exact kinds of uh, uh, fractures and um, problems. There's no differentiation in the, in the terms of males and females. And probably Neanderthal females hunted large game along with the males. And again, this implies that perhaps this lack of a sexual division of labor might have lent them to not be able to reproduce enough. Um, uh, and that coupled with the fact that they, didn't, they lived in very small groups as opposed to the larger groups that you find with Homo sapiens sapiens. And perhaps they just didn't adapt very well once the Ice Age receded and their main source of food, the large megafauna, uh, disappeared. And perhaps they couldn't reproduce effectively because the females were also engaged in hunting. And there might be a combination of things that led to their demise. Or it's possible that they, uh, we don't know if they could have bred because they are definitely a different species. Um, but whether they could have bred with uh, Homo sapiens sapiens and produced viable offspring, we don't know yet. But 
One of the interesting things that comes out of this is that it also explains the sexual division of labor in Homo sapiens sapiens in a kind of different light from the one we're used to. And what my uh, colleague in the next office said is that with the development of the sexual division of labor among Homo sapiens sapiens, what this meant was that women could provision men and allow them to go into long distance and long-term hunting trips uh, and as you know, hunting with a spear and a bow and arrow is not easy. It might take you a couple weeks to track an animal, kill it, slaughter it, and bring it home. It's not something like today where you just go out and shoot it. And uh, it wasn't like that at all. So the fact that women were largely the gatherers, although men did gather as well, and provided the day-to-day -day food allowed men then to do the more long-term food gathering of meat. Okay, So that sexual division of labor wasn't just uh, because women had babies, as we are generally led to believe. Although the gathering life is much more amenable to having offspring, where you can carry them on your back as you go gathering, so you work, and contrary to what we mostly believe today, women have always worked and had children at the same time. Okay? Uh, so that gathering kind of life, which is the, the form of subsistence, hunting and gathering, what we call foraging, was the way we lived for millions of years, uh, as human beings, and that sexual division of labor provided a nice uh, uh, compromise between the short-term getting of daily food, pl plant food, vegetable foods, and the long-term uh, getting of food, of hunting. Now, there are societies in which women hunt as well, but largely we associate mostly men do the hunting. Okay, and we, well, one of the things we know from our anthropological studies, especially from archaeological studies of tool complexes, is that human beings are constantly in contact with one another. Now, modern humans leave Africa, and they go east, and they begin to populate Eurasia and Asia and New Guinea and Australia, okay? And they go in the other direction, north and west, and begin to populate Europe. Uh, but, and, and they do this in more than one, one wave so that the original Africans leave and go, but there are other waves of Africans who leave. And that's why I say life begins in Africa. That's the homeland from which we've all spread out. If we look at shifts in tool complexes, we can see that where one person will discover a new, more refined way of making a tool, and then you'll be able to trace the development of that across different populations. So people who are not necessarily even in contact, who never see each other, nevertheless, uh, take advantage of this sociality. So knowledge, which Adam has been talking a lot about, spreads across human populations whether or not they're in contact with each other. And this great human sociality, this connection that was so important to our species is a primary factor in the success of the species. Okay? Human societies flourish because of our innate sociality. Uh, globalization is an extension of that sociality. It's uh, human sociality and human interaction between themselves and the environment that ends up giving rise to the processes of social evolution that we see happening around us. The differentiation and development and reintegration of our social structures results in the greater complexity until we have the type of uh, societies that we have today. This abstract process is experienced as modernization today. Uh, it occurs and is driven by technological innovation as well as some other factors. Uh, an increase in specialization of labor, for example, and the diffusion of resources and ideas. This process has gone on always, and we are witnessing the process as it accelerates today. Okay? That is, it has gone on always for the last 12,000 years. Okay? So for a few million years of our existence, we were happy foragers living in small groups, but nevertheless having contact with other groups, uh, re inventing and refining tools, um, learning a lot about plant life through gathering, and I'm convinced women were the first farmers, of course, um, because they were the ones who were most familiar with plants, and their early farming uh, is done a lot by women. Um, and so we have this process. It's a part of uh, living in human society. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the economic domain of human action because a lot of our talk about globalization, although not exclusively, uh, centers around economics. 
There are eight domains of human action. Now, you won't find this in any anthropology textbook. You'll find anthropologists talking about cultural domains. But I decided to call them domains of human action because of my particular take on the nature of social structure. And so this is uh, my way of uh, dealing with that. These domains are universal. Now, when an anthropologist talks about what's universal, what's general, and what's particular, we mean something very specific. Something is particular if it only occurs in one society. It's just particular to that society. Okay? And that may arise because people just happen to think of that, or it's something that has to do with a particular environment that those people are in. So that would be a particularistic trait. Things are general when you can find them across a bunch of uh, human societies, but not necessarily all of them, maybe the majority of them, uh, then we can make a generalization. But this still might not be true for everyone. But when something's universal, it has to apply to each and every human society. Okay. And the differences that we find between people are due to the differences in our environment and therefore our individual histories. The similarities we find are due to our common human nature. Okay. So there are eight domains of human action. Uh, that give rise to the social structures, and I'll explain that social structures merely the relationships that people have with one another in a specific domain uh, that form the framework for these societies and which lead to the development of inst particular institutions of human society as they become more complex. They're all there at the beginning when we're hunters and gatherers, but they're undifferentiated. Okay, So in every society you'll have to have uh, social relationships, the relationships we have between one another, how we reckon who we are, whom we are related to, uh, kinship, but also the free associations, the clubs, the various forms of organization that have to do with just relating to one another as people. We have the economic domain of human action, and that has to do with subsistence, how we earn a living, how we find the food and maintain our lives. We have the political domain, and this is about power, right? Our ability to act and how we organize that action and that power within a society. Uh, the legal domain, that is the customs that, uh, uh, that tell us what rules to follow, how we treat one another, and so on and so forth. The educational domain, which is how do we train the people in the next generation to survive. Okay. The religious domain, which deals, deals with spirituality. Okay, religion is a, a human universal. Not all human beings uh, practice spirituality in the same way. They don't all have formal religions, the, the kind we're used to. But spirituality, I think, is a result of our particular nature, the kind of mind and brain we had, this desire for transcendence, for connection with the rest of the universe. That's what I mean by spirituality, and that takes place in the religious domain of human action. The medical domain, okay, how, and a lot of these things are bundled together. And as society becomes more complex, they separate out, and then we get individual institutions. So you will, for example, find the economic and the political bound together. They evolve, but they're still bound together. My great dream is for the separation of economy and state, just like the separation of church and state. But um, that may never happen. Right now, they're, they're very well developed, and they interact, but they're bound together in a way I would prefer that they weren't. Again, the legal tends to grow out of the economic and the political as societies become more complex. Education tends to be uh, very generalized and then becomes more specialized as a specialization of labor occurs. Um, again, religion is bound up with politics, as you know, in the beginning. It's bound up with every aspect of life. It can affect you know, economics, uh, what you do when you slaughter an animal. You, you take a moment of silence in order to acknowledge that something has passed from the universe. Uh, all of these things tend to be undifferentiated in banned societies, and they become differentiated later as societies grow. Okay, And finally, the, art the um, artistic. Okay, Art is not something we develop when we de have a lot of leisure time. It's there from the very beginning. If you read ethnographies, you'll find people creating music and musical instruments and singing and uh, reciting poetry, what we would call poetry, and drawing on caves. All of that is part of our human nature, our way of expressing ourselves, and that's one of the domains of human action. But economics begins with subsistence, okay, earning a living. And as I said, the early economic domain consists of foraging and the things that go there. And what we find, and I'm going to concentrate on groups that we find in Africa because 
those will be the original examples, and we don't really know what the original hunters and gatherers were like, but we have studied hunters and uh, contemporary hunters and gatherers back before they had too much interaction with the larger states. And we found, for example, food sharing seems to be a common and basic element, especially with regard to meat. So everybody can hunt and gather. Remember, your resources are stored in nature. When you are a forager, you're a part of nature. We're a part of nature now, but in a different way. When you're a forager, you're a part of nature, okay? All, everything you use is stored in nature. Nobody can hoard that stuff because it'll spoil. If you pick more plants than you need to eat, it's going to spoil, right? Uh, it's hard enough to get to hunt a large game animal uh, so that meat spreads throughout the whole community. You have prearranged uh, ways of sharing that meat depending on how the animal's killed and by whose arrow it's killed. Um, but food sharing is a part of that, okay? Uh, so this is a very, um, this is, is the original state of nature. You don't have to create a state of nature if you're a philosopher because there was a real state of nature, and this is it, folks. When people lived in foraging bands, things were pretty much equal. Equality is something that was there in the beginning. I'm talking about human equality, although I'm sure people made distinctions between themselves and others, but you know, and there were skirmishes, and people did fight, there was conflict, but for the most part, uh, people were able to live equally because everything they needed was stored in nature, and nobody could keep them from it. You could try, but it was very difficult for any one individual uh, to do that because everybody else would gang up on him. Okay, so instead of that sort of conflict, which naturally occurs in any human society, uh, you get the mitigation of that through things such as food sharing, Okay, and cooperation. Um, in a foraging society, any man and woman can replicate the entire culture, <laughs> technically, because it's unspecialized. Uh, it doesn't mean everybody was an equally good hunter or gatherer, but every man and woman learned those things. And so you can tell something about the culture. Any man or woman could replicate all the things necessary to survive. Nevertheless, we lived in groups. Okay. Um, so equality is a basic condition at the beginning of human life. Even material equality, which we don't even want to talk about today, right? Because things were stored in nature. Everyone had access to them. What happened to change all that? Well, what happened was 12,000 years ago, people discovered domestication. Okay? They probably knew uh, how plants propagated themselves long before they became farmers, okay? They probably had domestic animals long before they decided to raise herds of animals. Human beings don't change a tried and true form of subsistence unless there's a reason to do so. So the fact that you know about how plants propagate doesn't mean you're going to suddenly say, okay, now let's all become farmers. That doesn't happen. Something happened environmentally, some change in the climate, some change uh, in, the, in the availability of things through hunting and gathering uh, that forced people then to add new knowledge and a new way of uh, gaining goods. So probably hunting and, hunting and gathering does overlap with the, with the uh, taking up of agriculture. So for a long time, people were probably doing both. And eventually, agriculture becomes the main form of subsistence and hunting and, and gathering are now minimal minimized. In certain areas where agriculture isn't practical, people instead invest in herds of animals. And so you get uh, pastoralism is what we call it in anthropology. Okay, once this happens, uh, this has a number of consequences. First of all, people can associate in larger groups. And then you get, instead of bands, you get tribes. Now let me make something clear. Tribes do not have chiefs. Okay? Chiefdoms have chiefs. We haven't gotten there yet. So far, band societies and tribal societies are egalitarian, okay? Although when you get larger groups of people, you have to reorganize the way you do things because knowledge doesn't pass in the same way when you have people whom you know uh, as opposed to larger groups of people who you can't know as intimately, okay? So Hayek was really onto something when he talked about the uses of knowledge and how the social structure determines in what ways uh, you have to accommodate that, that knowledge and the flow of knowledge. So societies become larger. 
groups of people become larger bands, or 30 to 70 people, maybe 100, 150 at the most. And once that happens, there's a, a major change. Tribal groups can be anywhere from a few hundred to thousands. You can have thousands of people uh, as pastoralists herding animals. Um, but they're still relatively egalitarian. Everybody still gets fed. Everybody still gets taken care of, although there are certain rules. Uh, you get more of a division of labor. Okay, People become sedentary. So when you become sedentary, then uh, something interesting happens. Women produce more children. Okay, And there are very, you can ask me about that if you want to know. There's a whole interesting story about that. And you begin to make a different kind of impact on the environment. Okay. When you become a farmer, you begin to make a great impact on the environment. And we have evidence that people had impacts on the environment. If you take the ancient archaeological site of Jericho, and yes, I'm talking about the same one where Joshua blew his horns and the walls came tumbling down. Uh, that site existed over many periods of time, but there are, are gaps of occupation at Jericho. And archaeologists have determined that, in fact, probably what happened is people just used all the resources in the area. They, they probably had sheep and goats, ate up all the grass, whatever, used up all the water. And so they just abandoned it. So the impact of people in the environment really begins with domestication. Okay? Now, you can go on forever living in a tribal society, growing your food and herd animals, having a relatively egalitarian existence. Okay? But in certain places, in certain environments, something else happened. Okay? I would say about 6,000 years ago, six or 7,000 years ago, land shortages started to develop. Okay? Now, and, and I'm, I'm speaking here, uh, this is based on Robert Canary's theory of circumscription, which was um, published back in 1972 in uh, Science. Usually, when people fight, and people do fight all the time, uh, men used to fight over <coughs> women. Okay. Believe it or not, women could be in short supply. And if you have, if in order to become an adult, you have to be married, you know, you have to have, you know, men and women have to be able to get together. So men and women, would, men would often fight over women. Or they'd fight over sorcery, the, imagine, the imagined use of magic to bring about bad things uh, that one group would use the other. However, a certain circumstances arise that causes people to stop fighting over women and sorcery, and they start fighting over land. And this is because in certain areas of the world, the physical environment is circumscribed. That is, it has natural barriers. Okay. In that case, it's possible for a population to grow and people to be engaged in agriculture and for you to run out of land. And when that happens, people start fighting over land. And inevitably, somebody wins. Now, normally when people fight and somebody wins, the losers simply lose. They pick up and go somewhere else. But what if you can't do that? Because on this side of you are mountains. On this side of you is an ocean. Or you could leave, but the stuff out there, you know, it would be too hard to make a li living if you left. Okay, this is called social circumscription. There just isn't, or there are other people there, and you can't, you can't move. Then you stay and you pay tribute. And the fact that you pay tribute with the land that you're doing agriculture on means that there's a great incentive to produce a surplus so that you'll have more. At least this is the way the theory goes. This happened in very specific parts of the world. It happened in the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys. That was the first civilization, Sumer, where Iraq is today. It happened in the Nile River Valley. It happened in the Indus River Valley. It happened in the Shang River Valley in China. It happened in the Valley of Mexico in Oaxaca. Uh, it happened in uh, northern Mexico. Okay. It happened independently in different places around the world where the environments were circumscribed. Okay. And this accounts for the development of the first states. Now, what initially happens is you get these chiefdoms. Okay. 
if you have a dispute over land, one group wins, okay, uh, they become the chiefs to whom you pay tribute. Everybody else are commoners. So now you get the first stratification of society, the first inequality, okay? Uh, some people paying tribute to other people. The people to whom you pay tribute ruling over you, okay? Over time, they take on this mystical quality. They become the royal family, okay? Or the royal clan or the chiefly clan and everyone else are commoners, okay? And people forget how this happened. They just know that this is the state of affairs. And this stratification, this initial stratification where you have two classes uh, is the beginning of uh, inequality. Okay. Now, if you go and you look at actual societies that are chiefs from today, well, they will look pretty equal still. But chiefs have special obligations, and so people pay them tribute. They have certain responsibilities. But as this goes on, say you start in one little river valley, and then you conquer another one, and another one, and another one, now you have a more complex organization, political organization, what we eventually call the state. Okay? And this is how it happens initially. And it happens in different parts of the world. And it's the response of people to a particular environment and solving that problem in a very specific way. And so this accounts for the rise of what we call, quote, civilization. Okay? The rise of complexity is what we call it in anthropology. Things become more complex because of uh, the differentiation of certain aspects of the social structure, political at first, but then economic social, and the reintegration of these new forms into the whole, okay? And now you have more features and you have more complexity. Uh, social complexity is not related to intelligence in any way. It's related uh, to the nature and the dynamic of the society, okay? I don't want to spend too much time on this. I'd be happy to answer questions about it later. In any case, um, this happens. Once states are, are in existence, they tend to produce other states. Uh, states fission off from existing states. Uh, people conquer other peoples, and that becomes a state. People consciously get together and form a state. But the initial states are exactly, again, in that box that uh, Adam put up. They are an unintended consequence of human action. They, people did not set out to, to form chiefdoms or states. It just happened because of the interaction of people in the environment and people with each other. Okay? This state is a spontaneous order, those first states. Okay? And then later on, people consciously start diddling around with things and other states come into being. And they will have different kinds of properties, and we can talk about that later. Um, now, what, does, uh, what do women and minorities have to do with this? Well, again, you get stratification. You get different classes. They're defined uh, as having different prestige in society. You have prestigious people in the chiefly class, in the royal class, uh, because eventually chiefdoms evolve into kingdoms. And it's uh, with a regularity that's amazing. It doesn't matter if it's in Polynesia or Europe or Asia. This is a common pattern. And one of the things that we've noted because the state arises from well, warfare, okay, I can't think of any state that's come into existence that hasn't been the product of warfare, really. Um, you have to have warriors for warfare. And what anthropologists have discovered in a number of studies is that there is a correlation between warfare and male dominance. Okay. Now remember, back in band societies, women were pretty equal with men. In fact, they provided 60 to 80 percent of all the food. And when you contribute to subsistence, you have power, okay? Uh, which is not to say there is exact equality anywhere, but relative equality is what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, and this is pretty much verified when we study certain hunters and gatherers, especially in Africa. Uh, but warfare changes that. Because now, and, and believe me, there are women warriors, but there are interesting theories as to why women don't participate in warfare in many societies. Uh, and mainly it's because uh, it's in societies where you're marrying uh, women from a hostile group against whom you might be fighting, and you don't want to compromise your loyalty. And so you don't let women fight, because they might be on the side of the enemy, you know, their families. <laughs> 
Uh, that's a whole other story. So there's a correlation between warfare and male dominance. And so you begin to see more and more inequality between men and women as this complexity grows uh, because of the uh, preeminence of warfare. Um, also, when we look at the, the, these distinctions, actually Peggy Ree Sande, who's at the University of Pennsylvania and whom I consider uh, one of the most gifted the gender theorists, uh, notices that there's also a correlation between the presence of female power and the kind of origin stories people have. So if your idea of how, and every, we all have origin stories, how we got to be here. If your origin story involves a female deity or a male female, it could be a husband and wife or brother and sister deity as the originators, as the creators, then you'll find that there's a strong correlation uh, with female power in a particular society. If your deities tend to be male deities, there's the other tendency that tends toward male dominance. It's not a perfect correlation, but it is a correlation. There's also correlations with um, the perception of the environment, whether you perceive it as benign or harsh, um, and so on and so forth. So that, that's just to set a little tone there. Now let's talk about trade. Because trade exists from the beginning of time. Even people in banned societies who are getting their food through foraging nevertheless trade with one another. They trade trinkets, okay? They trade um, food. They help each other out. Trade is both local and global, okay? And we know this especially after domestication because we find things, archaeologists find resources that are not indigenous to the particular area in which they're found. Okay. Sometimes they come from hundreds or even thousands of miles away. They've been traded through a series of exchanges, uh, and it, ultimately the people who end up with them never saw the people who originated from whom they originated, but they passed through many different hands. And again, this is part of a process that's been going on for a very long time. So economic evolution is, in a sense, tied to political evolution, and all the different domains are are going to more or less evolve together. That is, they're going to be more, become more complex together, although not exactly in unison. Um, so economic evolution is tied. The first states are agrarian states. They're based on agriculture. They're states in which the large majority of people are engaged in farming. Nevertheless, there are also, uh, there's also the development of a specialization of labor because you need uh, uh, th implements with which to farm, so you need people to create those. Um, you need a way of storing grain, so you, you know, people to produce pottery. Uh, you need something to eat off of, and so you produce uh, dishes and silverware or other implements. Um, uh, you need things to hold milk if you're a pastoralist, so you in invent uh, uh, containers. Uh, so there are all sorts of things. And as these states grow, and they become quite complex based on agrarians, you also need, you, you find people, uh, depending on which region you're in, all kinds of specialists. Among the Aztecs in Mexico, you know, when, the, when Cortes came upon the Aztecs, he was shocked to find a civilization as advanced as European civilization. Okay. Up to that time, he'd been working his way, you know, across. He'd met people who were rel living as in tribal groups. And he assumed that that was the, the nature of things. And he comes to the city, and it's astounding. And, and there's, there's all sorts of gold and uh, jewelry and things. And they had specialists who did this. And they even had guilds of specialists who did this. So while the large part of the population was engaged in agriculture, specialists were producing all the things that we associate with complex societies, with state societies. And again, uh, trading becomes even more a part of life once people settle down because you can't you find out people have other things that are very useful to you and so you trade what you have for those uh, cities or you know civilization means city and cities generally arise around markets okay they're places where people congregate to sell their wares to one another and then cities evolve from that so trade has always been a part of human life, and we should not forget that. It's not something that's distinctive to us today. Um, there's also always been a sexual division of labor, except if we count the Neanderthals, and that is also not a bad thing necessarily. Quite often, men and women divide trade. Women do local trading, 
men do long distance trading. Sometimes a whole family will go long distance, but most of the time it's, it's that division. Even in the United States uh, agriculture, we find that there's a division of labor, sexual division of labor on the family farm. Women will produce those crops, we call it gardening. They will sell them on a regular basis as the crops uh, ripen. They'll sell them in food stands, and this will provide money throughout the year. Men will generally concentrate on the big yearly crop or bi-yearly crop uh, that's going to bring in a lot of money, but which you know, is only going to happen at certain times of year. So this sexual division of labor even exists in American agriculture, and those women consider themselves farmers. Okay? A lot of the time outsiders think of only the men as farmers, and they're the wives of farmers, but they are farmers too. And this cooperation of producing um, the crop that will yield some income all throughout the year as opposed to the crop that will bring in big amounts of money if you're lucky, it's, uh, but only at distinctive times of year is a good combination. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit um, because perhaps um, the, the first year of what we could call globalization really is connected with colonialism, the exploration, European exploration. Now, I did want to mention this, that we're going to be talking about colonialism and, and the West, Western ex, exploita or European exploitation of the West, but it could have been different. We could have been, uh, exploration could have been in the hands of China, okay? Uh, there's a very interesting book out called 1421, not to be confused with 1491. Okay, 1421, uh, former cartographer for the, neighbor in, uh, for the Navy, in the course of doing research of old maps, found a lot of old maps that he attributes to the Chinese. He believes that the Chinese were the first to circumnavigate the globe. Okay. Uh, we know for sure that they got to the southern tip of Africa, but he believes they actually circumnavigated the globe. They uh, produced maps, and these were the maps that Europeans found uh, that perhaps Columbus used that gave them an idea that there was another world out there. Okay. Um, but what happened was, very interesting, uh, in 1421, um, whoever was in charge politically in China at the time decided that China would no longer do any exploration. All of the ships were destroyed, and China became very insulated. Okay. Chinese civilization is, is uh, an excellent place to begin to study because the Chinese invented just about everything. Okay. They did it very early on. A lot of uh, the technology and understandings that uh, allowed European civilization to develop came from China. Okay. Although we tend to have forgotten that, a lot of it came from the Middle East during the Crusades. You know, uh, Europeans were suddenly exposed to uh, civilization in the Middle East, and they learned a lot, for example, about mathematics and civilization there. Okay, so I'm I'm going to have to jump ahead here. I wanted to point out something that um, I think is very important, and you can challenge this, me on this if you want. When we look at the past, um, and people do draw lessons, we learn, okay, we accumulate knowledge uh, through trial and error, through all of the experiences that we have, but again, it's differential. We all don't learn at the same rate. But what I think we can say now is that principles are important. There are principles that guide human society. However, they're not self-evident. They have to be discovered. And I think over time, we have discovered a lot of those principles. Um, also, we know about the importance of the rule of law. Now, you might think that the rule of law is simply a Western affectation, but it's really not. It's part of the understanding of how human society operates. There have always been laws. They might have been informal in the form of customs and uh, traditions, but there's always been a set of rules by which people have to govern themselves in any society. So the rule of law is simply a refinement of that understanding. And it's very important to understand the cultural context in which things happen. Okay? And just to go briefly, I'm going I'm to have to rush through this because I'm running out of time. Uh, I'm struck by three examples, but there are many examples that we could talk about, of what happens when you don't follow principle. What happens when the rule of law uh, is undermined? What happens? Uh, when you don't pay attention to the cultural context. Okay, if we look, and I'm not, I'm not going to bother uh, to go far beyond that. Um, if we look at the U.S. Revolution, okay, slavery was a part of the founding, uh, was a part of the United States, of these colonies before they became a country. Um, 
Uh, and it was once considered a legitimate form of labor uh, by people all around the world. Uh, slaves were usually losers in battle, uh, but the expansion of Europe into the rest of the world required labor. And some of you know the story about how the first slaves were brought to the New World. It was out of sympathy for the Native Americans who were being sort of killed off and, and, and uh, because of exposure to diseases and very harsh treatment and so on and so forth. And Africans had been in contact with Europeans for a long time, shared all the same diseases, so they weren't particularly vulnerable. Uh, and some guy, um, Bartolome, Bartolome de la Casas, am I saying that right, folks? Yeah. Okay, thought it might be a good idea instead to import slaves from Africa, a decision uh, that he lived to regret. Okay, and so that was the beginning. Millions of Africans were moved from their continent. It didn't just happen in this direction by uh, any means. The African diaspora also happened in the other direction with um, uh, Arab commerce and slave trade uh, all around the Indian Ocean. Okay, but we're generally concerned with uh, the movements in this direction. So millions of Africans were relocated to the New World. Um, but contrary to, the f to what we learned in school, the first Africans were not slaves. They were on the ships with Christopher Columbus. They were Europeans of African descent who came over with Christopher Columbus and a lot of the other Spanish explorers. Okay, now, um, when we were, finally, we, we, uh, the colonies revolt against the British uh, and set about a constitution and they know that slavery is wrong, right, because all men are created equal. They know it's wrong. Uh, the northern colonies have gotten rid of slavery for the most part. They actually tried to get rid of slavery before uh, the revolution, okay. The southern colonies maintained slavery. Uh, when they were writing the U.S. Constitution, they had the opportunity to invoke the principles they knew were right and eliminate slavery. What they did do was eliminate the word slavery from the Constitution. It does not appear anywhere in the Constitution, okay, the word slavery. There are references to it, but uh, there was an objection to this great document containing the word slavery, so it's not there. Um, but they could have ended slavery right there and they didn't. And the cost of not following those principles that they knew already existed was paid much later in millions of lives in the Civil War. Okay. What would have been inevitable, because we know that because slavery has disappeared from around the world except in little pockets, could have been taken care of then. We had the correct principles, we didn't act on them because of economic interests. So that's a problem, and that's something that we should learn from. I want to move to the, I know I'm running over time here, uh, the example of the Haitian Revolution, and what happens when you have a rule of law but you don't pay attention to it. Slavery was a legitimate institution. I know we find it morally abhorrent, but it was at the time, and there were rules about how you had to treat slaves in almost every society. In Haiti, however, Haiti was a gold mine. Uh, it was a sugar colony. If you owned a plantation in Haiti, you could make lots and lots of money. And what happened in Haiti was uh, it was cheaper to work a slave to death than to buy a new slave. Okay. So this is, in effect, what happened. Now, there were rules about what you're supposed to do for slaves and how you're supposed to treat slaves in Haiti. They were ignored. Consequently, and this is, and sugar is a very intensive, labor intensive, and so it's a very harsh life. So any slave that set foot on the island of Haiti, or it was actually uh, Hispaniola, um, had a life expectancy of seven years. Okay. As a consequence of this, there were, co there were constantly fresh Africans being brought to the New World. They did not replicate themselves very easily because life was too harsh. These Africans remembered what it was like to be free in Africa. They remembered the homeland. Not only that, but they had a lot in common with each other. When the French Revolution took place, the talk of freedom not only inspired the people, uh, the Europeans in Haiti, 
It inspired the slaves. Okay. The consequence of this was um, that Haiti becomes the second independent republic in the West. The United States is the first one to rebel. Haiti is the second. And it's the result of a slave rebellion. Okay. Um, now, I'm not saying that if the slave owners had followed the rules of how, how you treat slaves, um, they would have been better off. Slavery might still not have lasted. But this assured the end of slavery and the revolt of slavery uh, in Haiti. And in fact, um, everybody lost. And in fact, the market itself becomes the condition under which slavery begins to disappear. It becomes an inefficient form of labor. It becomes a threat to people who want to engage in free trade. And so ultimately, it disappears. But over a long period of time, people, it takes human beings a long time to learn a lesson. We have to make the same mistake over and over and over again. Then finally, there's a little uh, inkling of what went wrong. I want to discuss now the Igbo Women's War and the importance of cultural context. Uh, women in West Africa were generally in charge of markets, and West African uh, countries or nations generally, or peoples, generally had what we call dual sex systems, where you had parallel um, governments for men and women. And a lot of the women's, uh, under the women's purview, uh, were the markets. Igbo women uh, had their own set of rules. And they were in charge of the markets. And when a man violated the rules of the marketplace, they would engage in what they called sitting on a man. Okay. And uh, this involved going to his house and tearing it down. Women would get together, go to his house, and tear it down. And men wouldn't interfere with this because it was the law. Okay. <laughs> However, under British colonialism, the British seemed not to know about the role of uh, African women in markets. And at some point, they were setting up a system, and a rumor got started that they were going to tax the markets. So what did the women do? They decided to sit on a man. But the man was the colonial government. So this incident is known as the Abba Riots, if you look at it from the colonial viewpoint. But from the Igbo viewpoint, it's called the Women's War. They marched on the colonial government and confronted them violently. And a lot of people were killed, essentially. One of the, one of the um, reasons this happened is because the British weren't sensitive to the local cultural context. Okay. Now, in Ghana, you do have still a women's market, right, um, that is very viable. And women run this market, the Kamasi uh, market. This is uh, something you find throughout West Africa. And where you have slaves that came to the New World, you also brought that um, have it over here as well. So a lot of the, uh, in the Caribbean, a lot of the people who carry on the markets there are women, the Higglers in Jamaica, for example. Uh, when we get to contemporary globalization and its effect on women and children, we can talk in generalities, OK? Um, we know that overall, there are a lot of statistics that show that life has improved, generally, for everyone. Life expectancy in the developing world uh, has doubled since the 1940s, for example. Um, the number of children in the labor force has decreased incredibly. There's been a decrease in child mortality in developing countries. Uh, certain diseases have been eradicated, smallpox, some that you have not even heard of, probably because they, uh, you've never encountered them. You get inoculated against them. But when I was young, diphtheria and measles, uh, if you, if you're, had someone in your house with measles, your house was quarantined. Okay, A lot of these things we've taken care of. Increase in universal suffrage uh, among nations. Um, most people, only 10% only, um, of the world's population lives in countries where they don't get 2,200 calories a day for food. Um, majority of people in the world um, uh, are literate, 81% roughly. And a large number of these are women. The literacy of women has increased. Um, and there's been an increase in cooperation. Uh, with the rise of the women's movements in individual countries, um, this, these local or national movements have become international. And so there's a new consciousness about how various elements of development affect the lives of women in specific countries. 
The status of women is now tied to development, whereas before it was mostly ignored or not understood at all. Um, and the same thing might be true of minorities. Now, the problem is that we can make these broad generalizations on the global um, level. But locally, <coughs> it's still possible for women and minorities to be fairly badly off. And minority, it, minority is a problem word for me because sometimes the minorities are the ones in charge. So it just depends on your particular local context. But when we're looking at and we're trying to judge the effect on women and minorities of globalization, let us not make the same mistake I was talking about in the beginning of confusing cause and effect. What you need to know for any local circumstance is what was the position, what has the position of women or various minorities been over time, and at what point does this effect of what we call globalization, and you might have some trouble figuring out when that begins in any given place, uh, how does that affect people then after the fact? If you have people suffering before globalization and globalization comes, you can't blame it on globalization. But it is entirely possible that some of the effects of globalization may have a, a negative effect on specific groups of people. That is a, a total possibility. What we're dealing with here is what we call modernization. That's what's happening in the world, and it's happening around the world, and people don't like it, and they've never liked it. They didn't like it when it happened in England, you know, which was the first uh, European country to industrialize. Didn't like it then. They didn't like it when it happened in France. They didn't have, really didn't like it when it happened in Germany. Okay, and that's one of the reasons we had World War II, because they didn't like it. Um, nevertheless, modernization occurs. It's really important not to confuse modernization with westernization. Okay? Uh, it is possible for western countries to impose their values on other people. But modernization is neutral. Okay? If you want to industrialize, if you want to take advantage of technological uh, advances, that's not westernization. Because the principles behind industrialization and technological innovation are neutral. Anyone could have discovered them. The fact that that happened in the West is just a coincidence. Like I said, it could have happened somewhere else, but it didn't. It just happened to happen in the West for a variety of reasons. But the other thing I want to talk about is the role of principles of morality and of equality. Okay, and I really am truncating my discussion here to get all this in. Morality comes into play in the, the legal framework that we set up in any given country. That's where the rules are specified. Morality here is our assessment of what is right and wrong and what is allowable in terms of human action. Okay? Markets can only exist within some sort of a moral framework. Okay? They cannot produce the moral framework, and I know I'd get an argument from some people about that. Okay? You have to have a moral framework in place in order for markets to operate freely. Okay? So that's why uh, this notion of universal rights is extremely helpful uh, as a basis for formulating the kind of legal structure that you want to have. Uh, and as I've said to some of you earlier, I do believe that there are universal human rights, not because Westerners discovered them, but because we share a common nature as human beings. So we all have the right to life, liberty, and the ownership of property, because we don't have property, we can't subsist. Okay? Property is necessary okay, for us to subsist. And if we don't have it, the right to have property, our existence is very tenuous. Okay? I do not believe that you can call rights that third category that some people refer to as social rights. Again, because of the contradictions involved. Now, so what if some people disagree with that? That's fine. We live and we learn. These principles are not self-evident. They have to be discovered. What works best as we're trying to set up a society? What causes some of us to prevail? When it comes to equality, I want to say that there are three kinds of equality, and I'll end with this. Okay? There's human equality. I talked about that at the beginning. Are we, in our various societies, acknowledging that all people are equally human? Okay? Do our laws, in fact, reflect, reflect this? Or do our laws create inequalities? As I said, people were originally equal, and then inequality comes with the rise of the state and the privilege of certain people over others. Political equality. Are, is this human equality recognized in our laws? Are we all, do we all have political rights, the same political rights? Okay. The tough 
form of equality which people are concerned about is material equality. Okay? That is contingent. Okay? Some people will say we can never have total material equality. Okay? And that's, that's debatable. I want to suggest that we can approach a relative material equality, but only with freedom. And even this is contentious. There was a debate between, in, at the University of Chicago Economics Department between Frank Knight and Milton Friedman. Frank Knight believed you never have equality. Friedman believed that if you had free markets, you would tend toward more and more equality. People would become better and better off. But material equality, uh, from my perspective, can only be achieved to the degree that you allow people to be free to create. I can guarantee you it will not be achieved any other way. I can guarantee that. I can't guarantee that the free market will make people totally equal, but I think I can say, I can predict that it would make people better off in the long run. Okay? So those three kinds of equality, I think, are the ones we need to consider when we're trying to decide whether women and minorities um, have been advantageously or disadvantageously affected by globalization. But remember that globalization is about human contact. And our technological innovations have made this more and more possible. Uh, and this is happening at a time when modernization is going over around the world. People are resisting it. But I would like to predict that, in fact, modernization is going to win out in spite of the resistance to it, that you will have modern nations with flourishing markets in the Middle East, in Latin America, in Asia, it's not absolutely uh, inevitable that that will happen, but if things follow the path that they have in the past, uh, if people learn from the past, then in that sense, this kind of development and well-being is inevitable. So I leave you with that thought. Please feel free to argue with me. <laughs>